presented by Ridley. Now and not yet. Hi, welcome to the Now and Not Yet. It's the show that keeps you plugged in on Bible and theology. I'm Mike Bird. I'm Scott Harrower. And today we're going to look at the book of Ephesians. We're going to look at some Ephesian themes. We're going to look at the topic of maturity in Christ, who does the work of ministry, and some stuff about ethics. Mm. But before we begin, the first thing I've got to note, note, Scott, is what on earth happened to your book? I mean, have you been have you been devouring them literally? Uh, it has been literally devoured by Poppy the Grudel. She's one years old and absolutely gorgeous, but she's a real chewer. So I had to remove the book and donate a thong. And by that, I mean sandal. What do you do in your family when your family members or pets chew your books? Well, the deal I have with dogs, if the dog chews the book, then I force him to write a book review about the book. Nice. Okay. Uh, That learns him. That learns him. And I now have a dog that has the best knowledge of the complete set of church dogmatics. 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 Church dogmatics. That's great. That works. No, it does. Next pet will teach catechesis if it's a cat. Yeah, yes. That does that that does rhyme. Um, we could come up with a few puns. What, what would a yak teach? I'm not. I have, I have no, no idea. idea. <laughs> Yakology or something. I, I, I don't, don't know. know. But anyway, but uh, Scott, I find jokes like that to be perfectly honest, incredibly immature. And we uh, we're told we need to have maturity in Christ. Okay. What okay. what is maturity in Christ? That is a. It means not being immature. That doesn't give me a positive definition. So okay, okay. Let me let me work with it. Let me work with it. How about this? How about this? Image, uh, being mature in Christ means we realize who we are, our identity, our vocation, and how to appropriately act. Okay, so that sounds like wisdom to me. So it's about yeah, knowing yeah. what it's you It's kind of like do. wisdom premium. Okay, let me give you not a wisdom definition, but yep. a nature relative definition. You're a new person who's a child of God, you've put on Christ, Yep. so you have a new nature, and maturity in Christ is actually flourishing according to that nature. So it's a nature relative definition. Okay. So it's more than just wisdom. It's actually becoming a new person. But how does that apply, not just to an individual, but to an entire congregation? Because as, you know, in Ephesians, which we'll talk about soon, uh, the whole church is meant to attain maturity in Christ. What does it mean for a congregation or even a Bible study group or, you know, any group of believers gathered together, particularly the church, what does it mean for, for them corporately to attain maturity in Christ? It means two things. It means that that group of people would have the qualities of Christ, so the attributes of Christ, so meek, humble, pure-hearted, peacemakers, righteous, persevere for doing the right thing, yep. the qualities of Christ, and also they put in together with their gifts. So they Ah. use their gifts together to serve the one faith in which they're united through baptism together to build up that body. So So it's about character and gifting together. So character and gifting. So every member of the orchestra is trained up and deployed into their role. Even the triangle. Even the triangle. Well, we love the triangle. (laughs) The one instrument that even I managed to stuff up because (laughs) I have the musical talents of a sedated sloth. (laughs) <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. So well, how's that definition? I think that's good. The only thing, the only thing I also want to would want to add to that is I think maturity in Christ means you're not dragged around by the latest fads. Right. Now, sometimes the latest fads can be anything like, you know, we've got to um, we've got to be a seeker sensitive church. Then we've got to be a healthy church. Then we've got to be a messy church. Messy church. Then we've got to be an emerging church. Yeah. Then we've got to be a post-deconstruction missional church. I don't know what their latest thing is today, but it's like the latest fad. And this can also happen in a super spiritual sphere. And, for, I'm, and remember the Toronto blessing? I do. I lots, was there. Lots of laughing. You're in Toronto. You're in Toronto. No, I was here in Melbourne when the blessing came through. Okay, well, my friend. And I remember it was powerful. I went to Toronto, man. Did you? Not to get the blessing. You received the anointing? No, I. well, the anointing I got was some Tim Hortons donuts, which I thought was just as good at the time. But anyway, that's another story. Um, But, yeah, like it was the Toronto blessing. Then there was the thing about, you know, gold fillings in the teeth. Yes. I remember that. Yeah, I missed out on that. Yeah, I missed out on that. uh, My feelings stayed very, very um, (laughs) – yeah, the, al- the spiritual alchemy did not work for me. <laughs> but, work. Th- but there are these fads. Yeah. And I know some people who are always into the latest fad. 
Yeah. And so, you know, you know, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, walking around your city and praying for it to, to uh, set up these spiritual walls around it. I mean, there's, there's all these sorts of, you know, the latest fad, the latest technique. And Why is faddishness a problem for maturity? Uh, because it shows you're just you're just running to and fro the latest thing, and you're often not discerning whether it's wise, whether it's wholesome, whether it's even genuinely from God or simply from the flesh. Yeah. And I th- I think one of the signs of a mature person and a mature congregation is discernment. Yeah. Good it's one. like okay, I'm old enough and wise enough to have seen things like this before. Yeah. And this is not the big spiritual steroid that you think it is. How do you tell if something's from God though? Like that's a question that a lot of congregations have here in Australia. Most congregations are under 150 people. Yep. They they want to grow, they want to engage with their neighbors, uh, with the culture well yeah. and healthily. What are the criteria for recognizing that perhaps a new way of worshiping together or spending yep. time together as a church might be from God. What are the criteria? Yeah, yeah, we've got to be open to the Holy Spirit. I mean, that 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 dude's a maverick. I mean, he does not care about your old tired way. I mean, the Holy Spirit is a maverick. He does he does radical things. But here's the thing: um, it's got to line up with Scripture. Okay, so even that the most um, you know fresh movement of the Spirit, it's yeah. it's going to be operating in the realm of God's will, God's purpose and plan laid out in the scripture. It's got to be scriptural. Like what would that look like though? Okay. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of like um, if someone says, I think the Holy Spirit is telling me to replace the leadership with a new person called Snoop Pope Daddy who will lead us to an imminent eschaton, probably a bad idea. Yeah, probably, probably a bad probably, idea. Probably, but so, most ideas aren't that outrageous though. Yeah, well, most aren't that outrageous. Okay, forget Snoop Pope Daddy and just make it apostle for entrepreneurial vision and yeah, pastoral okay. leadership. It's more that kind Okay, of, change the lingo yeah. slightly more Same believable. Thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean it's got to line up with scripture and also you have to look at its fruit. If it if it promotes unhealthy relationships or cult-like behavior or if it justifies immorality or something like that, it's probably bad. But, okay, and a mature person would would say, I think, okay, I've seen variations of this, and this is just the same, and this is taking us in an unhealthy direction. Yeah. So that's what I think maturity in Christ is, both individually and as a congregation. I think one of the things that we we're still kind of stuck with is this '90s model of churches need a leader who's innovative, entrepreneurial, and basically a cowboy who's going to take us into new. Uh, places. That, Scott, like, I love them. Don't you diss the 1990s? <laughs> we had Friends. We had Millie Vanilli, yeah. the greatest rock <laughs> band in the history of the universe. So uh, I'm concerned that even when I read ads for Christian uh, ministries, we have a lot of people that get in mm. touch with us about Christian jobs. They're essentially still advertising not for someone with great character, yeah, but but for the the like energetic entrepreneur who's going to gather the team and take them to the promised land. Yep, someone who's going to say fix bayonets for going over the top. Yeah, yep, something like yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, uh, I know, I know what you mean. I mean, and the idea that that the the best leader is the gung ho, high caliber, extroverted. Um, head kicking, sort of, you know, um, can KPI do, person. KPI person yeah. is where sometimes you need someone who's going to do the the patient ferment of Christian ministry. The the gathering together, the, yeah. the walking together, and yeah. I, I mean, you, you bring out each other's best when you act in love towards one another and yep. trust one another in holiness. And I, I just don't get why when we're advertising for Christian jobs that they, they don't advertise character. Yeah, and I, th- and I think ca- character is indicative of beliefs and values mm. because as you believe, so you behave. Yeah, and if we want mature Christian organisations, yeah. whether mm. they're churches or not, yeah. we've got to be advertising for the qualities of Christ in yeah. a person and we need to be looking at their track record to see whether or not they enable other people to use their gifts. Yep. So, Which is why what we should be advertising is not someone who's effectively a Christian entrepreneur, mm. but someone who has demonstrable Christian gifts mm. and Christian character. Exactly, mate. And I think that's that's what you should be looking for in a Christian leader. So if you're ever looking for a new pastor, a new youth leader, yep. new associate pastor, character, 
giftings. I think those are the things that are mad. That'd be for a mature leader mm. and mature leaders lead to mature congregations. Yeah, good one. Hi friends, hope you're enjoying the show. And if you are enjoying it, hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to share with your friends if you think they'll enjoy it too. And especially leave a comment or question. We'd love to hear from you. Well, Scott, we're doing some stuff in Ephesians today. We've looked at maturity in Christ. Now, I want to jump on one of my exegetical hobby horses. Okay, go for it. This is a, this is a verse in Ephesians. This is from Ephesians 4, 11 to 12 where Paul says uh, he, that's God, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And then notice this. This is verse 12. It says, uh, this is the King James language, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So there's all these gifted people who li- who work towards the perfecting of others. Yep. Uh, exactly, and, and that's their work of ministry, yeah. and that will lead to the edifying of the body. Now, I want to compare that with the uh, King, uh, not the King James, with the NRSV, and very similar as the NIV, which has this in verse twelve. Okay, rather than the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry for the for the building up of the body, it says this is what it says instead. It says to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Notice the big difference there. So these pastors, evangelists, and prophets and teachers, they are equipping the saints so the saints can do the work of ministry. Oh, they're not perfecting the saints. No, that they're, they're equipping and training and coaching the saints so the saints can do the work so of ministry. So who's supposed to do the work of Christian ministry? Here? And there, it, my friend, is the question. Now, this is, this is my theory, is that once upon a time, people used to think ministry is done by the ministers. So right. the priest, the pastor, the big kahuna of the parish, he or she does the work of ministry and us, the humble, lowly laity, we sit back and receive. We pay and pray. We pay, you pay and pray. That's what we do. Now, of course, you know, certain traditions emphasize some good things like the priest of all believers, that the spirit works through the whole body of Christ. And they don't like the idea that ministry is just done by the ministers and they want a more egalitarian approach. So we should all, we should all be on staff at church. All, I mean, if you remember the church, everyone's on staff. Everyone has to contribute. Everyone has to serve and do something. And I think that kind of ethos has led some people to make some curious, in my mind, uh, that's a polite way of saying grossly wrong and totally inappropriate, (laughs) exegetical decisions that lead to a more more egalitarian view. And, I mean, there's so many things to it. I I don't think the word, um, you know, the Greek word behind all this for for, um, perfecting or equipping, I don't think it means equipping or coaching. It means... Perfecting. It means like, you know, putting a bone straight, okay, you know, fixing something, um, putting it right, making it better, okay. It's, 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 and that's how it gets used generally. And, I mean, we could have all sorts of debates about the Greek. But this, this is an interesting thing about how your philosophy of ministry mm. can influence uh, or sometimes in some cases even overpower uh, your sense of Bible translation. So uh, this is one occasion where I, I do think the old King James has got it right, and the old on the and the, the newer translations like the NRSV, the NOV, uh, I think it's their ecclesiology is driving the Bible translation. And, and I should say this, you know, my view is that when the pastors pastor, when the teachers teach, then the church, uh, the saints are perfected, the body of Christ is built up. If you look at the wider context of Ephesians 4, there is stuff that mentions what the general church can do. So it's not just a top-down kind of a thing. There is a role for the laity in the ministry and service of the church, but pastors are not just coaches, okay? Pastors should pastor. Evangelists evangelize. They're not just consultants. And, and, and that's my real kind of pet peeve about this. We can end up treating... Um, ministers, you know, as if their job is just to be consultants mm. and to help us do the ministry. And that would come at the cost of the pastor teacher actually doing good pastoral care and teaching in a church because exactly. they're busy running a how to preach seminar. Yep. They're not in your home praying as you're struggling with your parenting. 
Yep, exactly. Right? And I, I think that's 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 the problem. Now that doesn't mean that running a seminar, you know, with some you know good leaders on how to preach or you know or pastoral care for you know home group leaders. I'm not saying that's not a bad that's not a bad uh, a, a thing. Uh, it's just saying the church is built up when pastors pastor. Mm. When, you know, uh, evangelists evangelize, when teachers teach. That leads to the perfecting of the saints, attaining maturity in Christ. Do you think some of this is driven by the fact that we just don't know what to do with pastors these days? Well, yeah. We, we just don't have a sense of what, what a pastor's purpose is. They don't fit into um, the patterns of a normal workplace. We sort of don't really understand the spiritual realm very deeply. So coaching... Mentoring, that's something that we understand from the secular world. Yeah. So maybe this is also um, a reflection of the fact that we just don't know what to do in terms of ministry structures and what counts as Christian ministry in the first place. Yeah, and, and I can I can plot this over the course of, you know, my lifetime. I remember people telling me in the 1970s pastors were treated effectively as counsellors. Right. In the 1980s they were then treated as entertainers. Right. In the 1990s they became coaches. Uh, then in the sort of, you know, noughties, they became digital entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know what they did in, in the noughties. I don't know, maybe, maybe just... I think there thing. was a shamanic aspect because we had lots Ooh, of shamanic. Mo- movements Fancy of the spirit. Word for the day. So ministers were shamans. They'd bring a, a word of insight. Remember, oh, okay. this is after yeah. the charismatic renewals. Yeah. They'd bring a in, word of insight, word of knowledge. They'd be up the front embodying what a real Christian experience involves yep. Yep. as they're praying for you. Yep. So I think there was, a, there was a shamanic aspect of Christian ministry that, um, that that was present when we had a stronger charismatic influence in our churches. Okay. That's not to say that being charismatic is necessarily bad, but when no, no. you've got a, sh- a shamanic quality to pastoral ministry, that would be... Uh, that would be bad. I mean, that goes, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, um, what does it mean to be a, a, a pastor as a shepherd? And it's not the ordinary vocation. You're not just a, a you know, a 24-7 counsellor. No. Uh, but you're not kind of a religious entrepreneur either. No, um, so so you're, you're teaching and doing pastoral care. Yeah. In such a way that people might be perfected in Christ, so grow yes. in Christ-likeness. Yeah. And... As part of their growing in Christ likeness, they will own the gifts that they have yep. and work for the common good in holy love together. Yep. So you're at the center of a network of channels of the Holy Spirit's work in people's lives. Yep. So you're like a gardener. Okay, well, that, that's a new metaphor. Yeah. Yep. Or you're running a series of aqueducts, just trying to help the Spirit flow in the Although community. Although often healthily. I think being a pastor feels like. Um, putting your thumb in various holes in the dike of the church. <laughs> it's probably how – I'm sure it's how it feels to a lot of people in ministry, yeah. but I, I like the idea of, you know, gardening. Um, well, I mean, the uh, the Puritan tradition talked about the, the cure of souls. Yes. Yeah, which, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, obviously that can go in a lot of different ways, but the idea that you're, you're, you're going to be the person who's going to help them through the various stages of life to attain maturity in Christ. That's right. To live the Christian life, and you're going to go along leading with them. And you're not just a re- you're not a religious entrepreneur. I mean, you may be entrepreneur. You may have great gifts and vision. Mm. You 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 may be very entertaining as a speaker. You may be a great counselor. But ultimately, it's that you know walking alongside people in their own Christian journey, teaching them the truth. Um, cultivating into them the virtues of Christ, getting them to participate in the mission of God. So, again, there is a mission for the laity here, just in case we're being misunderstood. There is a mission for the laity. But the ministers do their ministry, and that ministry is the perfecting of the saints, and for them that's their work of ministry, and that's the building up of the body of Christ. Good one. In Ephesians, there's also a lot on ethics, particularly get chapters, you know, chapters four and chapters five about how to live the Christian life. And I mean, ethics is, is, is a big thing these days. I think everyone likes the idea of being ethical. But what I've noticed, particularly in the last 20 years, Scott, is when it comes to ethics, there are three things that seem to be determining ethics. Okay. Uh, the first thing is that uh, a strong belief in bodily autonomy. Okay, so, you know, I can get as many tattoos, as many piercings, I can marry who I like, or as many people as I like, you know, big belief in in bodily autonomy. 
every ethical issue is also viewed through the lens of oppressor and oppressed. Right. So you're either a pre- oppressor or you're the oppressed, mm. okay? And I think there's also a dichotomy between pleasure and pain. Uh, if it feels good, it probably is good. Uh, if it feels bad, then it is bad. Mm. So if you say anything that makes someone feel bad, you know, even if it's true, well, it is bad because it's making you feel bad. And that means you're also an oppressor because you're, you're saying things. So I, I find ethics these days are largely about that. Personal autonomy, uh, oppressor or oppressed, and pleasure and pain. That's, that's how the world does ethics. And you've also noticed the fact that it's highly coercive. Yes. Like if you're not on board with a new program, you're in huge trouble. You are. You're not just a bad person. You're, you're almost like an enemy of the state. You're, you're a misanthropist. Yeah. You're a hater of the human race. So, for example, the National Hockey League had their Pride uh, weekend and everyone had to wear the Pride jersey with the, the colourful uh, – Backs Rain, and everything. Rainbow thing. And yeah. anyway, there was there was one dissenter yep. amongst all the players. It was a Russian Orthodox guy. And, yeah, all the pre- and post-game interviews were about what the hell are you doing not participating in the way that the world's going. And the language is by not participating, you're c- causing harm and trauma. Absolutely. And that's like you are hurting people by refusing to partake and that's kind of weird for me because you know like by refusing to affirm things like you know i i don't believe in consubstantiation i don't think lutherans feel traumatized by that just because <laughs> I, I see just because i fail to affirm their view of the lord's right. supper you mean consubstantiation in terms of the bread and the wine in yeah, communion yeah, yeah exactly oh so nothing so, to do with con or cohabitation or, no 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 oh, consubstantiation okay, right. Right. um i don't believe in consubstantiation I don't know any Lutherans who feel traumatised by that. Yeah, and you and I are against the gambling lobby in politics. I hate them with a passion. Yeah, same, same I hate here. them more than I hate coffee. Yeah, you and know you what? You know how much I hate coffee. Viewers might not know this, but about eight years ago, uh, I remember talking just outside, and we were both interested in getting into politics, but we both realised that the fact that the gambling lobbies run our major political parties meant we basically got to participate. No. Yeah. So, look, it's a tricky time to do Christian ethics, yep. right? And Christian ethics basically has three aspects to it. And it's a, there's an easy way to remember it. Commands, character, consequences. Yep. Commands. What are my obligations to other people in this situation? Character. Who am I becoming as I act in the way that I intend to act in this situation? Consequences. What are the likely outcomes of how I behave in this situation? Yeah. So um, commands is the central one because the understanding is is that the person in relation to others, including God, is at the core of Christian ethics. And there's an obligation expressed in commands to be righteous, to do the right thing by one another. Yep. Now, I'm hoping that you're hearing how different this is to rights talk, Yep. right? Because rights is normally about me, my rights, and don't get in my way. But Christian ethics begins with what are the obligations on me by the fact that I'm a human being in relation to other images of God under God. So that's an absolute game changer. So com- righteousness com- yeah, and completely love. Completely different paradigm. Yeah, completely different paradigm. Righteousness, love, truth, central. Who am I becoming is very simple. Am I becoming someone through this course of action who is growing into having the character that Jesus describes on the sermon? Or the character Christ himself had. Yes, absolutely. So it's an imitation of Christ. Absolutely, an imitation of Christ empowered by the Spirit. Yes. Okay. So commands, character. The third one is consequences, and this is considered to be the weakest angle. Yeah. Because you can never really anticipate all the consequences of your actions, right? Um, so therefore you never determine a course of actions based solely on consequences because yep. you don't really know where that's going to go for sure. And also historically people have excused all kinds of crazy behaviour based on consequences and not thought about commands and character, right? Yep. So basically for the Christian, it's a mixed ethical model drawn from Paul's ethics largely, Yep. commands, character at the centre, and then the consequences are a secondary concern. 
Okay, that sounds like a good way of uh, understanding ethics and certainly that will help people if they think about ethics in Ephesians 5. Yeah, and remember, you're, you're trying to live well under God regardless of what forces are against you. That, yeah. That's what matters. Yeah. It's you and God in this context. Great way to put it. So, Mike, we've spoken about Ephesians a whole bunch, but um, where would I go to get a good commentary on Ephesians to help me unpack it? Well, there are a lot of commentaries on Ephesians, but I do have a particular favorite author on this. I'm a big fan of Professor Lynn Coick. Now, Lynn has written two commentaries on Ephesians. There's a kind of short one in the New Covenant uh, commentary series, but the, the bigger one, the big juicy meaty one, is in the NICNT series. What's the difference between uh, the slim one and the big one? Uh, well, this one's sort of, you know, a somewhat cursory, you know, glance at the text, you know, just mentioning a few issues. This one's a little bit more in-depth plumbing into it, going into a lot more detail. And uh, Lynn is a great communicator. She knows all about the historical background and the context in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, she also wrestles with the big context uh, uh, questions, salvation by grace, the household codes, you know, things about slavery and, you know, submitting to husbands and all stuff like that. Spiritual warfare, it's a terrific book. Uh, the other one I will say you need to keep an eye on, which will be coming out soon, is by Con Campbell. He's got a volume coming out in the Pillar New Testament commentary series. Mm. Uh, Con is great. Uh, Greek guru. Uh, very good communicator as Jazz well. Jazz musician. Jazz musician. So his ex of Jesus will be syncopated. It will. It now, will if I'm, be. I'm a small group leader, do I really need the big one? Well, if you're a small group leader, I would go for the small one. Okay. But if you're doing uh, sermon preparation or you're at Bible college, I definitely go for Lynn in the. That's NICNT. the one to go for. Okay. So that's my that's my uh, sheer gold pick on Ephesians commentaries. Good on you, Mike. Okay, Mike, I wanted to talk about a really helpful resource um, to do with Christian ethics. This is the Cambridge Companion to Medieval Ethics. Medieval Ethics? Yes. Anything good like besides torture and the Black Death? What else medieval stuff? What's when someone good? says that is medieval, that's not normally a good adjective. What's good about Medieval Ethics is that it does take you into a different terrain, Mike. So you will be thinking along with Augustine and the other greats of Christianity who will use themes like your relationship to God in love to direct ethics in a way that no contemporary author will. Okay. So your ethics will be pastoral because they will be centred on love and what God is doing through the church in love as the foundation for ethics. So it's super theological. It's not just about dinking and diming commands and rules yep. here and there. It's refreshing and awesome. And here's the other thing. It also has Jewish and Islamic ethics. We need to get into comparative religion and being able to understand other religions these days and work in a cross-religious way. Well, that, as, Scott, yeah. I say, when you say the word comparative religion, that's yep. going to freak a lot of people out. Because they think, oh, comparative religion, that's the secular alternative to doing theology. And that's what liberal progressive do, you know, comparative religion. But in a multicultural world, knowing how, you know, Muslims or yeah. Hindus think yeah. about, you know, ethics yes. is probably a good idea if you're living in a multicultural society or you want to reach out to Muslims, Hindus. Yes. Because it's not, it's not just post-religious nuns we're speaking to when, when it comes to ethics and, and religion. So... So, so, so knowing a bit of medieval ethics with all those things coming in is, is a big help. Yeah, it's a big help because ethics is an easy-ish way into understanding what it looks like for others to live a different religion. Yep. And it gives you an easy way to compare the outworkings of religions. It also means you can read some Islamic stuff without being overwhelmed by it because it's just about ethics and you can read some Jewish stuff just about ethics. So it's not too overwhelming. It means you've started to engage with Islam and Judaism in a, in a really fresh way. Yep. So I recommend this to all our students. Right? Medieval. I don't recommend many things that are medieval, but if Scott recommends it, <laughs> then I recommend it. It's a helpful one. Okay. Now here to be controversial once again, I just, just want to talk a little bit about one of the assignments that I said here at Ridley College for our 
ethics course that I teach. What I do is I ask students to look at one of the chapters on an ethical topic from the Catholic Theological Ethics Handbook. Catholic Theological. Scott, yeah. I get my ethics from the Bible, not from the guy <laughs> in the pointy white hat, because of Martin Luther's Reformation in 1517. Did you know nothing? So we're going back to Catholicism. You want to take us back to the Middle Ages into Catholicism? <laughs> I'm getting scared, Scott, <laughs> and I'm scared of only two things: sharks with lasers, man. Okay, and I'm getting scared. Okay, um, but the point of the assignment is that you're working with Roman Catholics who, in one chapter, for example, they deal with hookup culture. So they do a Catholic theological ethical engagement with hookup culture and how to respond. Because they're close to us. And they're the Catholics, yep. but they're not us because we're Protestants. It's actually really helpful for our Christian Protestant students to see how other people deal with ethics in a similar way, but it's not quite what we would do. And it helps our students think about why. Why isn't this like our ethics? Now, that's much harder than if I just give our students some secular ethics and ask them to compare and contrast. They'll just dump some Ephesians in the middle of their assignment, and that's easy. Yeah. But actually disagreeing with Christians over sources for ethics, the centrality of righteousness and love, for example, character consequences and outcomes is actually quite hard to do. Okay. So it's actually sometimes better training for students to have to deal with like-minded people rather than people who are clearly coming from a different perspective. So that's just to give you a little bit of an insight into how we try to do high-level ethics here at Ridley College. Okay, final question before we stop, Scott. Yeah. When it comes to ethics, who would you rather compare uh, the New Testament with? Jordan Peterson or Pope Benedict XVI? Well, Pope Benedict XVI is an absolute legend, so that's easy. Um, I think. And George what's Jordan Peterson? What's he mince, mince meat pie? <laughs> well, what do you know. call him? He's the greatest in Canadian intellectual since Justin Trudeau. <laughs> yes, um, I think the thing with Jordan Peterson is because he's at more of a distance from Christianity than the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> he's harder to work with. Plus, he has a lot of psychological paradigms that many people don't understand well. So he's Jungian. He's Jungian. Yeah, so yeah, I think like Benedict is great because like his work, say Jesus of Nazareth, yeah. um, is very deep in terms of the, the foundation for ethics that we have as people who are joined into the body of Christ and are to model the life that he lived by the Spirit. That's amazing stuff. Yeah. Whereas Peterson's stuff, it's really good tips for getting your life together, yeah. but it's not Trinitarian ethics. Yeah, and it's, it's more kind of just don't be a leftist postmodern person is pretty much what he's doing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think his paradigm of chaos versus life, like we all understand it, um, but if you came to Ridley College, you'd be hearing... Uh, probably not Jordan Peterson. You'd be hearing some. Which is probably a good thing. Yeah, probably yes. a good thing. Okay. Well, that's pretty good. Well, we've covered a lot today. We've covered uh, maturity in Christ. We've covered who does the work of ministry. Uh, we've also talked about ethics. And now you know what to read for ethics and a good commentary in Ephesians. Good anyway. Great. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.